where is home? Uh, that's what I'm asked. Is home an imagination? Is home somewhere we stay? Is home a house where we currently stay or where we have stayed in the past? Now you would be imagining why I am asking these questions. I'm asking these questions because home is a distant dream for me. I'm a refugee in exile. I was born in 1989 in the Kashmir Valley. You must have heard about Kashmir Valley as a paradise on earth. You must have heard of Kashmir Valley as a place where tourists, thousands of them, go every year. But you must have also heard about terrorism that has engulfed the Kashmir Valley, a part of India, for the last more than three decades. Now take a moment again, and we were forced into a refugee camp in Jammu. Overnight, our life changed. Everything changed. And as you can see here, my parents and my great-grandmother, you can see the haunted faces. And this is how everything really changed, and thus began my life, my journey. And this is a ticket which began my journey, really, and we have preserved this for the last more than 30 years. My family actually left our home, our ancestral home in the Kashmir Valley. Now, this is a photograph of my father and my grandfather in the Kashmir Valley. My father, Dr. Utpal Kaul, was a publisher, is a publisher. And day in and day and night in Kashmir, he used to sell, in fact, these books not just to universities and schools, but to educational institutions, to universities, to other uh, you know, important scholars, you know, politicians, day in and day out. It was the oldest publishing house in the Kashmir Valley. And this is the photograph from the late 80s, where my fa father can be seen in Renavari, Srinagar, along with my grandfather and others at that bookshop. Now, since our life changed, this bookshop changed. We met this exile and our life started in Jammu, not very far from Kashmir Valley, but far from us, far for us, far for our homeland, which was Kashmir for years together. In Jammu, we stayed in a garage, in a garage for weeks together, a garage that was for more than uh, three months our home, a garage that was attached to a cow shed. And that's where, again, our journey began. And more than a dozen members of my family stayed in that garage, in that cow shed, and, you know, began our life. My great-grandfather, Dr. Samshachan Kaul, was the first ornithologist of Asia. He was a bird watcher. And uh, the most haunting aspect of this photograph is that this was an ancestral house of more than 150 years. This is my first photograph again on my first birthday, uh, and my parents are feeding me. You can see behind uh, this photograph, there is a cloth that is covering the trunks uh, in a refugee camp. And again, this is how life began. I'm giving you this picture to tell you how life gives you, gives you hurdles, challenges, and everything before you. And often, you know, people ask me, where do you find yourself five years from now? Where do you find yourself 10 years from now? And I tell them that this is a very illogical question. I live in the present. I live in the present because my parents have told me that think about the present and that will shape your future. Yes, dream big. Dream certainly big. You have to achieve big, but make your present better. Be a better human being. Be a compassionate person. Be someone who actually has a passion to do something that you are really, really crazy about. That madness to do something, to achieve something, will lead results. Because you might plan something to become something five years from now, but perhaps that divine energy above, if you have that belief, if you have that faith, has planned something much more bigger than what you have planned. So yes, dream big, but don't get stuck on that particular plan. Be a better human being in the present, and perhaps that will yield more results. This is me. This is my photograph from my first day in school. And you'd be surprised that although most of my life has been in South Delhi, uh, but this photograph is just two miles away from this location 
where I started my school journey, just like yours, here in this particular school. I was in another school two miles away from here, and we stayed in a one-room apartment. Again, this, is, this residence is also about two to three miles from this location, where I started my journey with my parents, my grandparents, and my great-grandmother. My first day in school, where I am actually uh, smiling and moving. This is my great-grandmother uh, blessing me on my first day at school, and you can see again a haunted face because she could never imagine starting life. She was in her early 90s and starting life again in a faraway land in scorching heat, and thus began her journey as well. She couldn't survive much. In 1994, she passed away in this same house. So life changed over the years. Uh, just like I said, don't predict anything. Life changes. Today, I'm a bald man. <laughs> 14 years ago, I was something very different. So this is from my university days, 14 days ago. So before I come to the university part of it, I want to begin by telling you how my parents struggled. My parents struggled every day over two decades to, in fact, begin life from scratch here in Delhi, as I said, just two miles away from this location. And my father actually held cartons of books on his shoulder and moved around for miles in Delhi to sell those books and to start life from scratch. You know, he didn't have the resources. He didn't have enough money uh, to take care of his entire family, but he struggled. My mother supported him in, the, in this entire process. She got a government job because of her education and her achievements in the university, but she held my father's hand and moved around all across to sell those books. But during that course, when this was entirely happening, she also held his hand when they together went to the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, a very prominent hospital in Delhi, when my father met an eye hemorrhage. And thus started a very, very tough journey for him. He met at least five surgeries in his eye. And due to the stress and, of course, the disbelief of his present situation, he met uh, eye hemorrhage and lost vision in his eye. Now, he might have lost vision in his eye, but he had a vision to rebuild life. Well, I'm sure most of you would be, you know, toppers, very good in your studies. I wasn't. I was a below average student, and all my school life I was very shy. I didn't interact much with my, you know, co uh, classmates, etc. But uh, life changed in March 2006. I was giving my last examination in the final year of my school, uh, I think psychology. Uh, I wasn't interested in that subject at all. And uh, I started an online petition, an online petition to, in fact, bring justice to rape and murder victim Priyadarshini Mattu. Now, those were the days when there was no Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram, no Snapchat, uh, or any of those social media. Orkut was just arriving in India. But I started this online petition somehow. I had no plans. I was just moved by her story so much. She was a Delhi University law student who was raped and murdered in 1995. But for more than 10 years, her parents were struggling to get any kind of justice. There was no hope of justice. The CBI, the police, the government, the judiciary, the investigative agencies were all silent. They had put the case in cold storage. The petition that I started gained momentum. There were hundreds and thousands of signatures that came about. And those signatures led to a movement in India in 2006. And we started the Pre Justice for Priyadashni Mattu campaign. The same time, we also started the Justice for Jessica Lal campaign. I'm sure most of you must have seen No One Kill Jessica. And this is me, Delhi University. This is for a documentary uh, that was made by Rakesh Om Prakash Mehra, or uh, Rubaru. Uh, I was giving an interview. This is the Priyadashni Mattu protest. You can see me on the left side here. And of course, thousands of people came, including actors Anupam Kher, politician Menika Gandhi, and many others who supported us. And very next day of this protest that happened in sometime June, July 2006, the Delhi High Court took cognizance and put this case that was pending for 11 years into daily hearing. At the same time, I started another campaign, justice uh, and, you know, anti-caste space reservation campaign in 2006, along with my friends and supporters. This is us coming out of the Rashtrapati Bhavan, along with my friends uh, and interacting with the media. This 
is a photograph two months from that particular protest outside the Delhi High Court. This is me along with my friends and others when we won the case. I received a lot of threats inside the court, outside the court, etc. And at that moment, I was 17 years old. Now, during the course of this entire moment, we received justice for Prezashni Mattu, but I thought myself that I wasn't doing enough for my own community in exile. So after almost two decades, I was about 18 years old, I decided that I need to form a group. So we formed a group called Roots in Kashmir for justice for the Kashmiri Pandit community. And we organized protests all across India, as you can see. I was roughed up by the police as well. And in due course, I was arrested also once uh, for protesting outside the house of a cabinet, union cabinet minister, and finally did spend some hours inside the prison. I was in my house and we received news that Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam is being made the president of India. Now to my surprise or to my great excitement, Abdul Kalam was my neighbor in Delhi for many, many years. So on the eve of him becoming the president on July 25th, 2002, I visited his house and congratulated him. Well, I was really young, I was in school, you can see me on the extreme right, and that is APJ Abdul Kalam in the middle. Instantly, although he had massive security, he was the DRDO chief, and of course, he had great threat to his life, but he was very, very accepting. He met us for at least an hour, took us inside his room, interacted, and told us something that has always remained with me. He told me something that I will tell you here, and I would request you if you could repeat after me. Can you? Dream. 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 Dream transforms thoughts into action. This is Dr. Ibija Abdul Kalam. He came from a humble family, not many resources, selling newspaper, not doing much, but finally achieved everything he could. You know, he was a Muslim, but he remembered the Bhagavad Gita by his heart. He was a scientist, but he played the veena uh, at his house. I went to his room. His room was empty. His room had a small bed, a small table, and that's about it. He just had books all across, and that's how his passion for life began. It was time for me to dream big. All my life, I wanted to become a journalist. Activism perhaps had only been an act, a small, uh, you know, an accident in my life. So again, I decided to become a journalist. In 2008, I finally started my career in journalism from the Times of India. It's been 13 years now. It's been 13 years that I have been a journalist, more than 13 years, and I've worked with more than four or five organizations, but more than three have been the top Indian media organizations. And sometime, if you think that you can achieve something, you can certainly make big. And let me tell you, many of you might be shy kids, and many of you who might be watching me later on electronic platforms, on digital platforms, might be shy kids. Let me tell you, I began my journey in school as a shy kid. I was bullied. I was bullied in school. I was bullied in my professional career. I was bullied during my activism for my teeth protruding out, for being a bald man, for just being a shy kid, for being someone who was just laid back, who was lazy, who didn't know what to do in life, who wasn't much interactive, who was just isolated, lost in his own world. But I did something very opposite. In my school, my friends or people who knew me were shocked. Somebody who did not talk all his life, somebody who did not interact all his life had become a journalist, and that too, a TV journalist, an anchor, a reporter for most of the English news networks in India. So that changed my life completely. Now, it's been a 13-year-old journey. I have visited more than 15 countries reporting for India. I have traveled from the United Nations to the European Union. I've traveled from Iraq in the peak of ISIS in 2014. This old man, uh, when he had psychological problems, but this photograph has haunted me always, stayed with me, and given me some kind of courage as well to be humble, to be grounded, to in fact not have airs about you. People might know you, you might become a big so-called celebrity someday. You might be appearing on television, but don't forget where you belong. Don't forget where you have come from. Don't forget your roots. 
and that's what really matters always. This is again in Kashmir where I went and although I've been very vocal against terrorism all my life, this was at a house of a former terrorist. The same terrorist burned my house, the same terrorist actually led to my exodus and exile, but I helped him get his justice, get him, get his money back. So again, I tell you today to rise up. I tell you today to think different. I tell you today to in fact have some commitment in life, have some, you know, thinking about what do you need in life. Yes, you can plan for five years, you can do whatever you want to do, but stay humble, you know, it might be the minutest thing because what I believe is that your income or your what you receive, the richness that comes from is not the money in your bank balance or bank account. The richness comes from your integrity. Your integrity is everything in life. Your richness comes from having a courage of conviction, a conviction of courage. If you have conviction in life, if you have integrity, you have achieved a lot. And that's what your mission should be. That should be your talisman. And you should continue to strive harder to stay on ground and achieve everything because that is what matters in life. I reached this studio not because I knew people who were powerful, not because of social media likes or you know dislikes. I reached here because many years ago, decades ago, decided that I wanted to become a journalist. I, and I strived hard to achieve big in that life. So today's journey, uh, today's speech was about my lost home, was about my own journey, my own life, a lot of hurdles, a lot of challenges. You know, often over the last many years, Indian Army and the CRPF invite me to speak about national security. They ask me to speak about Kashmir, they ask me to speak about foreign policy. But before I begin my speech always, I fold my hands. I fold my hands in gratitude. I thank them for, in fact, protecting Kashmir, for protecting us from the terrorists, for not thinking about their own families, but for thinking about India, for thinking about our nation first. So today I am here before you, irrespective of those challenges and narrating my story. But perhaps someday I hope to return. I give this message to the ISIS that you may threaten me, but I'll go back to my homeland. Someday I will keep traveling back to report to perhaps someday live there as well. And I hope someday I will go with my parents and stay there in Kashmir.